Savvy Central Radio, drawing out the best from our guests with host Christina Nichman. Wednesday, July 15, 2015, from 6 to 9 p.m., Savvy Central Radio hosts our fourth live interactive business networking event and interview with our guest, national seminar leader and best-selling author, Paul Mlajenovic. Paul shares with us his classic program, Zero Cost Marketing. Come join us for a fun-filled evening with fellow entrepreneurs over light fare and cocktails as you build valuable contents and knowledge. If you're in the New York City area, get your tickets today and come join us at bit.ly.com slash Savvy Marketing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Savvy Central Radio. This is your host, Christina Nichman. Each week, Savvy runs weekly broadcasts providing entrepreneurs and successful individuals a platform to express their dreams, hopes, lessons learned, expertise, and wisdom with the world. Our guest today is Dr. Lance Price. Lance is a professor at Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. Director of Antibiotic Resistant Action Center, Lance is a public health researcher who works at the interface between science and policy to address the growing crisis of antibiotic resistance. In the policy arena, Dr. Price works with grassroots organizations, NGOs, and policymakers to develop science-based policies to curb antibiotic abuse. Find out more about overuse of antibiotics on the film that featured Dr. Price, Resistance, at resistancethefilm.com. Hi, Lance. Welcome to Savvy Central Radio. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm very, very happy to have you out here this month on our State of the Nation Month, where we're talking about really important current events in our nation and things that are very important to all of us in this nation and around the world. And I had seen you speak on a very important documentary called Resistance recently, where you shared a little bit about uh, the crisis of antibiotics and the overuse of them in our food production and in our society. So before we get started with all that, share with audience a little bit about your background and what led to your work as a microbiologist and in working in antibiotics in particular. Well, so, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I grew up uh, in Arizona, but my family had a cattle ranch in Central Texas, and so uh, I got to spend every summer working on the cattle ranch, and, um, and I had this close tie to um, food animal production, I guess. And uh, when I went to college, though, I studied microbiology and um, eventually started working in a microbiology lab doing research. And uh, before that whole anthrax letter debacle in 2001, um, I was actually doing anthrax research and studying antibiotic resistance and how basically anthrax becomes resistant to important drugs. And it was when I was doing that research that I learned about antibiotic overuse in food animal production. And I, I was just appalled at the way antibiotics were being abused by food animal producers. And I said, you know, this is something that I have to do something about. And, and so I kind of led, started my journey on this research. Mm. And so I know everyone in the audience probably is familiar with the term of antibiotics. We get an infection, we run to the doctor, and they prescribe some sort of antibiotics. But what exactly is antibiotics and what are their benefits? So at the simplest level, antibiotics are, are most of them are not natural compounds, uh, natural chemicals, if you will, that, are, um, that microbes produce to kill other microbes. Mm -hmm. And what we have learned to do is use those to kill bad microbes in human bodies, right? And, and what's neat about and, and special about antibiotics is that they do that very specifically. And so we can ingest them or inject them and, um, into our bodies, and they specifically kill bacteria, but they don't kill us. You know, so uh, the counterexample would be something like chemotherapy, right? When we're trying to treat cancer, because of those are our own cells, when we try to treat those cancer cells, kill those cancer cells, we actually hurt ourselves as well. But antibiotics specifically kill bacteria. And that's, and, and so they were discovered in the 1930s and introduced into medicine and have saved countless lives since then because of this special property. Mm. And is there ever a way you can actually overuse antibiotics? Yeah, I, pretty much any time you use antibiotics unnecessarily. So mm. if you go in and you have a cold with a virus and you say, 
and you demand antibiotics from your doctor, you're, you're overusing them. You're, you're abusing them, in fact, mm-hmm. because, be- because antibiotics only work against bacteria. So if you think about the microbial world, uh, there are bacteria, there are fungi, there are parasites, and there are viruses. And antibiotics only work against bacteria. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, pretty much any time we use antibiotics, we're potentially selecting for antibiotic-resistant bacteria, so we should only use them when absolutely necessary. Um, and so overuse happens in the hospitals when doctors just overprescribe or patients demand antibiotics, or in food animal production when food animal producers use them to compensate for poor husbandry practices. Mm. So this g- leads me to ask you a question I just came to me in that anyone out there who said, okay, I'm feeling under the weather, I think I have a bug, I think it, you know, they're not sure if it's um, something that's bacteria related or virus related and they're demanding that they get some antibiotics because they just think it's a cure-all. When, how could they know one from another and to be more concerned with just like, okay, now I actually have a bacteria as opposed to a virus? Yeah, they they should they should let the experts tell them so that they should ah. ask the physician what they're infected with and ah. only take an antibiotic. You know, let the doctor decide whether to give them an antibiotic. They can obviously be um savvy patients and and ask lots of questions, but um but I think mm-hmm. you know there's been this tendency in our culture of of going in and saying, "Look, I don't care if it's a virus. I don't care what you're saying right now. I just want an antibiotic because I know antibiotics are good and they treat, they, they mm-hmm. fix infections. Yeah. But in fact, they can actually make you sicker. And now there are some, there are bacteria out there that are resistant to antibiotics. And so when you go in and you demand an antibiotic, you can actually make yourself uh, more susceptible or more, um, yeah, make yourself at, more at risk from these superbugs mm. by taking an antibiotic. And I think women have known about this for a, a lot longer than men, right? So because they understand when you take an antibiotic that you can have this, uh, you can instigate this, uh, this imbalance in your microbes, right, and, and lead to things like yeast infections. Uh, but men are, uh, men are slower to learn this lesson, right? <laughs> Well, I think also it's part of the culture that we we've been le- we've learned that doctors are our quick fix. We come in, we get a pill, we get a subscription, and we feel better. And and like you said, we've been taught that kind of antibiotics are like awesome; they're cure all. And we've got problems. Hey, they'll give us a little antibiotics. We'll go home. We'll feel all better. But sometimes, you know, if you have a, a virus, it just might have to work its way through your system, rest, lots of fluids, and you'll get better. But it might not be an overnight or within like an hour or so, popping a pill and you're all better. Exactly. I mean, you would need an antiviral for a a viral infection, and we just don't have that many antivirals. That's why we have vaccines to prevent viral infections, but we don't have as many good cures for viral infections. Yeah. But but again, uh, the antibiotics, when used improperly, when you have a viral infection and you demand a, an antibiotic, you can actually make yourself um, mm. at risk for other types of infections. Mm. And I find that interesting because recently I heard a couple news reports where there's this older guy who liked to surf. He went out, went surfing. And he was in rather dirty water because I think during the springtime, the water turns up a little bit funky stuff. And he got a Mercer. Merce? MRSA, yeah. MRSA. Methicillin uh, resistant staph aureus, yeah. Yes, and he died just four days later, and I was like, wow. And so that leads me to ask you the next question. What exactly is a superbug, and is it coming about for the reason you just mentioned, the overuse of antibiotics? Exactly. So superbugs are basically, you know, this isn't a technical term, but this is, most of us use it to describe disease-causing bacteria, so there are good bacteria and bad bacteria, so these would be bad bacteria that can cause infections that are then resistant to multiple antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So basically limiting the the doctor's options for treating infections with these bacteria. And um, and in some cases, these superbugs are resistant to all of our good, safe antibiotics. And so those are really scary infections. MRSA that you mentioned is... uh, You've heard of staph infections probably all your life, right? right? Yeah. Staph infections. Well, these are staph infections that are resistant to some of our best antibiotics. Wow. So the class of antibiotics that we call methicillin or 
um, the you know broad spectrum penicillins. Mm -hmm. And um, so basically these are these can cause infections that are very difficult to treat because of this resistance. Mm. Well, that, that's definitely a scary proposition. Now, you also mentioned that a lot of antibiotics are being used in our livestock and food animal production. And in some cases, it's not exactly very safe. Why is that? Well, uh, you know, basically what happens is that um, when you use any time, as I said, mentioned before, any time that you're using antibiotics, you're potentially helping mm -hmm. to grow these superbugs, right, through a through a process of natural selection or, uh, you know, very, very rapid evolution mm -hmm. um, where, you know, you can go from a single, just, just uh, there's a mutation that occurs in the DNA of the bacteria and you can go from a single mutation or a single sort of mutant superbug mm -hmm. to a billion in 24 hours. And so when you have, now imagine what happens when you have um, say 70,000 chickens all crammed together in a concentrated animal feeding operation or CAFO, mm -hmm. and you're feeding them low doses of antibiotics mm -hmm. to make them grow faster or to compensate because of the way you're raising them, that means that there's this, there's this huge driving force for superbugs to spread among those, those birds. Mm -hmm. And then those bacteria can then spread to people, either people that are going in to take care of the birds or people mm -hmm. who are are exposed environmentally, but also then when those animals are, are cut up into meat, those superbugs can contaminate that meat and be on our grocery store shelves. Wow, that is a really scary proposition. Now, you mentioned the way some of the animals are being kept. Um, now, what are the different ways that animals are being kept that are less than safe that are causing them to want to use small doses of antibiotics? So, um, well, I mean, the, the way we produce animals in the United States has become industrialized over the past 50 years or 50 plus years, um, where, you know, we're trying to, we, the industry is trying to, you know, make the system very efficient so that they can produce low cost mm -hmm. uh, meat to, to the consumer. And, and so one of the things that they've learned is that they can, uh, rather than let chickens roam around out in fields or pigs roam around out in fields and in little mud pits or whatever <laughs> we used to kind of imagine them doing, um, they instead put them into these operations that we call concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs where they're all packed in together and, and they defecate on and near one another. And so there's, there's feces all around them and they're stressed out because they're so crowded. And we know what happens when people are in unsanitary, crowded, stressful conditions, they get sick, right? Well, the same thing happens with animals. And unfortunately, that's just sort of an integral part of the model now. And so, uh, so rather than sort of change the model to give them more space, to make it cleaner, uh, to give them better quality feed, etc., they've tried to compensate by using antibiotics to just sort of head off infections. And what that does is basically drives the evolution of these drug-resistant bacteria. Mm. Wow. I've heard, actually, that um, we're one of the cheapest as far as inexpensive food of all sorts in the United States. And other countries actually spend a lot more percentage-wise of their gross annual income on food and such. And we spend a lot less than a lot of other nations. Now, a lot of people out there are like, you know, I like the low grade antibiotics being used for livestock and such because I want to keep spending less on my food products and stuff. But what are the consequences of continuing to do things the way we're doing them? Well, I mean, I, I, you bring up a good point and And, uh, but I think there's two pieces to that. One, I, I don't think it's necessary to use antibiotics to have an inexpensive product. If you look what happened in Denmark, mm -hmm. uh, when they banned all unnecessary antibiotic use in Denmark, they cut antibiotic use by 50%. And what happened is that their industry actually grew by 40% over the next decade. Mm -hmm. And they are the world's second largest um, pork exporter. So they compete on a global market. And I can tell you that the Danes make a good living, so their wages aren't, aren't low. Um, and, and so they are able to raise animals in an efficient way, compete on a global market without abusing antibiotics. And so I, I think it's a false trade-off, actually. 
Um, and and particularly in poultry, we've seen that there's there's just really no actual benefit in terms of productivity by using these antibiotics. It's just an old part of this model that um, it's sort of uh, it, it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of mentality in the industry. But from a public health standpoint, it is broke, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, if I can use the sort of slang there, because we are creating drug-resistant bacteria that can then mm-hmm. cause infections in people that are costly themselves. But that is a cost that's externalized. So now getting to the second part of your question mm-hmm. is what does this cost society? It's, it costs us, um, costs us lives in terms of people who succumb to drug-resistant infections. Uh, drug-resistant infections cost more to treat and in terms of, you know, you got to use, uh, there's some trial and error in terms of finding an antibiotic that does work. If you do, in fact, save the patient, uh, they end up staying in hospitals longer. And uh, sadly, you know, people die. Yeah. And so there's a societal cost to that. Yeah, absolutely. And I heard during the documentary that there was a slight decrease at first when they when they did their cutback in antibiotics, but then they had an increase, which I found very fascinating. And I know some people will listen in and go, well, that's the Danes, and they're much smaller than the United States. But it doesn't matter. I think we could start today, implement what they have, and totally compete and have a very booming market and I think we would come out on top like they have in the long run because of course as you mentioned even the people working with the livestock it's not safe for the livestock and it's not safe for the farmers working with them in in the present conditions that we have exactly and um you know and you're you're right so in Denmark there was this uh it seemed like there was a a temporary Mm -hmm. uh blip in the increase in the um the number of piglets that were dying when they stopped giving them antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the cure was not to just give them antibiotics again. The cure was to increase the quality of their feed, to leave the piglets with their mothers longer. So they had to wean, they wean them longer. Mm -hmm. And so um, they got those antibodies from the mom. And, and, and actually, so that may seem that that did slow the process down a bit, but it turned out that the mother then had, the sows then had longer, uh, larger litters the next round. And so it turned out to be a good thing for the animals and a good thing for public health as well. But what I can tell you, and I've seen the data from, um, from the Danish poultry industry as well, is that they had zero impact on their productivity with the uh, elimination of these antibiotics. So there was no problem there. And just one thing in terms of scale, in terms of Denmark, yeah. um, they, Denmark is a small country, but they are on the scale of Iowa in terms of their pork production. Mm. So uh, p- pigs way outnumber people in Denmark. Wow. And again, as I was saying, they're... Uh, the world's second largest pork exporter just behind the United States. Wow, that's amazing. And so for anyone out there, for us to start fixing this problem in our society here in the United States, what would be some of your your top fixes that we could start to do to get this revved up and turned around? Everything from uh, when you go to the hospital or go to the doctor, you know, again, don't, don't demand antibiotics. Let them tell you what you need. You can ask questions, you know, is it a bacterial infection? Do you think it's a viral infection? Mm-hmm. You can ask questions, but don't assume that you need an antibiotic. When you go to the grocery store, look for the label, no antibiotics ever, or no antibiotics administered, or raised without antibiotics. Those are uh, USDA-supported labels that mean that those animals were raised without antibiotics to make that meat, and that's good for society. When you go to restaurants, look for look for those labels. And when they make a when they say, "Oh, this is from X farm," go ahead and pull out your smartphone and look it up. Does that does that farm have good policies? Uh, I do that all the time. It's kind of fun because <laughs> sometimes they'll have they'll have a, a label on their X farm, but it turns out it's just a, a massive commodity producer that does use antibiotics. And so, you know, be a savvy shopper. And then when you're in D.C. or when you're in your home district, talk to your legislators about this issue. Say, hey, we need antibiotics for our children. We need antibiotics for our grandchildren. And there's this crisis with antibiotic resistance. Mm-hmm. I want to see policies that protect antibiotics for future generations, both on policies that affect antibiotic use in agriculture, but also antibiotics that are policies that affect, that could 
induce the development of new antibiotics. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that you mentioned consumer power because I don't think people realize how much power they have in their hands, not only talking to your legislators, but also realizing that you have the purchasing power. If people only buy organic and free range meats and livestock, the other can exist. They will continue continue to lose profits and have to change the way they do things because we, the consumer, will not tolerate anything else. We will not tolerate sick meat or, or animals being treated badly just so they can make profit. Now, you also mentioned something else, which I don't know if we really hit on strong enough, which is the idea that now we have antibiotics today that can help us. If we continue on this current rate, is it possible that we could lose all antibiotics that are helpful for humans? It's it's not it's not going to be absolute like that. Mm -hmm. So what what happens is that um, think about the seasonal flu. So every year we we know we have these viruses that sort of spread around the world, right? Mm -hmm. So new strains of viruses spread around the world, and sometimes they're worse than others, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's a mild flu season, and sometimes it's mm -hmm. a really dangerous flu season, and so. The same thing happens with bacteria is that there are these waves of drug-resistant bacteria that spread around the world as well. And, and so what happens as these things spread is sometimes there, there's a, a bacteria that's resistant to, to most of the antibiotics. And so for that strain of bacteria, mm -hmm. we don't have good antibiotics to treat it, whereas mm -hmm. some of the infections can still be treated. But basically, some, some infections will still be treatable. Mm -hmm. Whereas others, and unfortunately, an increasing percentage of them will be untreatable. Mm. And so there's a little bit of a crapshoot when you go to the doctor. Yeah. And I, I like that we're going here because in the movie Resistance, I know it mentioned a number of parents who had children dying of, of infections that could have been cured and should have been cured but they were resistant to the antibiotics. So that's what we have that could happen in the future more and more if we don't start to reverse our current situation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't want to leave people with the, you know, this, <laughs> this sort of dire view of the world. I, I think what I've seen from my, my work in Denmark, so I work very closely with the Danish CDC, what I've seen in Sweden and other, these Nordic countries where they really value antibiotics mm -hmm. and they've, they have really good uh, hygiene practices in their hospitals and they have really good antibiotic use policies in their hospitals and they have really good antibiotic use policies on their farms mm -hmm. where they minimize it to the very the, the very minimal that they need to do the work, mm -hmm. to, to make people healthy, to raise animals. Um, what we see there is very little resistance. And so it is somewhat controllable. Yeah. But when they do see people with drug-resistant infections there, it's often associated with people who have traveled. Mm -hmm. And so I just think if we value antibiotics, we can turn this thing around. But we need to do it now. Right, because there are these drug resistant bacteria that are spreading globally mm -hmm. that uh, the only way to fight them is to decrease antibiotic use. Wow. Well, it's been fabulous having you out today. This is very informative and helpful for our audience. And I'm so grateful that you came out to share your wisdom on this subject. Thank you very much, Lance. Thank you. Wednesday, July 15th, 2015, from 6 to 9 p.m., Savvy Central Radio hosts our fourth live interactive business networking event and interview with our guest, national seminar leader and best-selling author, Paul Mlajenovic. Paul shares with us his classic program, Zero Cost Marketing. Come join us for a fun-filled evening with fellow entrepreneurs over light fair and cocktails as you build valuable contents and knowledge. If you're in the New York City area, get your tickets today and come join us at bit.ly.com slash savvy marketing. Yeah.